I'm George Reister, he's Ralph Amson, and this is the Pac-12 Apostles. This week, we got a lot of big-time action in the Pac-12. We had upsets and, and, and controversy and everything else. Um, so, Ralph, after a strong start to the season, how would you grade this week for the Pac-12? Week six. Well, if we're still pretending that UCLA and USC are part of the Pac-12, <laughs> if there had never been any realignment talk at all, then I think this would be a pretty damn good week. <laughs> but instead, we're looking at like the, oh, hey, we're losing the two best teams in the conference. It's not like we're the Big 12 looking at Texas being middling and Oklahoma uh, getting blown out and probably not even being a favorite against Kansas this weekend. Like the Big 12 is uh, has already moved on. They're already trying to determine the hierarchy of what their conference is going to be after Texas and Oklahoma bounce. And uh, and we're sitting here like, uh-oh. <laughs> Once the two L.A. schools go, what are we? And I yep. think that, that that it's just it's a bummer because you can't enjoy UCLA doing what they did to Utah because you're like, man, but also they're leaving. Yep. It, it, exactly like people uh, i've been on people's shows and they've been like man how's the pack 12 doing i'm like bro it, there, there's no back to pack anymore it yeah. is it is tired i mean and how can you say back to pack and care anything about what ucla and usc are doing not even a little bit it, uh it's bittersweet man i feel like the four other guys in nsync watching justin timberlake release 2020 with jay-z oh my <laughs> So, dude, I'm sitting here, and we actually got news that, well, from Greg Flugar, who has been all over the conference realignment, broke USC to the, uh, that they were talking to the Big Ten. He now says that the hot window is now closed, and that expansion is on pause for right now. Do you believe that to be true? Yeah, I I do. I know you consider him to be credible. I've watched some of the videos that you have sent um, uh, that he's done to me. I love how like low tech they are. Yes, I still like. I, I don't care. Like, you could be talking college football into a paint can out in the desert, and I'm probably gonna listen. Like, but he 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 seems to have a pretty firm grasp on what's going on. Obviously, he has the ch the track record. But it was like this week we had conflicting reports that Oregon and Washington were about to bounce now that the exclusive TV negotiating window was opened. And then he came in and he shut that down. I think that I think I think everybody it's in everybody's best interest to seek the best possible short term deal for for the Pac-12 products um, so that you can we can find out if three, four years from now, the Pac-12 is still viable and worthy of keeping everybody in the fold. I also think it gives the PAC 12 the ability to reach out to other schools to make sure that we stay at 12 and, uh, and also, you know, give them what to expect when they come in, because it's probably going to be at a discounted, um, at a discounted rate. And my guess is we're going to be rating Mountain West teams. So I don't know. The whole thing is very, very interesting to me. Um, I, I was thinking this week, why stop at 12? I was I, I was really considering like why if if you're gonna get everybody in at a discounted rate on a short contract, what's the point of going to like why not why not go above why not do what the Big Ten does or the Big Twelve does and not have the number mean anything, and just bring in the California schools and maybe UNLV or something. So what uh, San Diego State and who else? Fresno, San Jose, UNLV. Mm. Oh God. Oh. Oh, they feel so beneath us. They feel so beneath us. Um, and I mean, as an Oregon so guy, this year, this year <laughs> as a couple of years, you couldn't say that about San Diego State, right? Um, so I do, as an Oregon fan, if this news is true, I hope it's not true <laughs> because I want us in the Big Ten. I mean, I just, I just, just do for financial reasons, for recruiting reasons. <clears throat> for getting a national championship reasons, I think that you're better off there. Um, I think that USC is going to find a tough time <laughs> in the Big 12 adapting to – now, granted, they have to play in weather some, 
when you head to Pullman, depending on the time of year, Oregon State, depending on the year, you know, even Seattle. But listen, it ain't like that heading to Michigan, Michigan State, Ohio in 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 November and December, bro. It's be colder than the witch's titties out there. Um, now, now. It'll be interesting because I think that we're going to find more out in short order. So, man, but there's still so much in flux. So let's get to the games from last week. Um, So uh, first game up, UCLA, Utah, UCLA, 42, Utah, 32. I thought UCLA was going to had a good shot to win this game. But Dorian Thompson Robinson, there is no player that gets hotter than Dorian Thompson Robinson. I mean, not Bryce Young, not CJ Stroud. When this dude, when he gets hot, he's cooking with Crisco, bro. Cooking with absolute, absolutely Crisco. Like there's nothing you can do to stop him. He threw for 299 yards and four touchdowns, had a couple rushes that were very important to keep drives going. Zach Charbonnet went for uh buck ninety-eight. And a touchdown. Like, Utah, I think that we saw in this game, Utah's good. Utah's solid on both sides of the ball. They're solid on defense, solid on offense, but solid doesn't beat good teams. Solid yeah. loses 42 to 32. Well, you, uh, the thing with the, with Utah and UCLA in this game is you can make a pretty strong argument that up until 11 minutes left in the game, not only was it still a game, but Utah probably should have had the lead. Um, they yeah. That first, that first drive of the game, like turning the ball over, uh, and, and turning the ball over multiple times, um, coming out with, you know, and they, they had held, I think, UCLA to a missed field goal. That it was, it was enough of a game that it, with about, I think it was about 11:40 left in the fourth quarter. Then it, it in you, but UCLA never slowed down. No. They never made more than one or two mistakes. No nope. offensive line, which is made up of four seniors, three redshirt seniors and a and a and a redshirt freshman like they the misdirection stuff they were doing where everybody would pull left and then they toss right and say, like, all right, Utah's linebackers. Let's see how good you are at tackling. And Zach Charbonnet just exploited them all day long. I thought the offensive line was so dominant. And the thing you bring up about Dorian Thompson Robinson about when he gets hot, there's a, just a few times in sports. But like when you watch Ken Griffey Jr. walk up to the plate. And he had like the swagger in his walk yeah. up. To yes, the box. you knew what was gonna happen. Barry yeah, Bonds, yep. Yeah, same with same same with Barry Bonds. Like you have a, a you know a runner. Like there's no uh, like the the bases are loaded, and it's like all right, are we gonna are we gonna walk him in? Or are we actually gonna have to? Be <laughs> <laughs> or are we gonna give up guy. one run or four runs? Yeah, and when things are going well for UCLA, you see him walk up under center, and it's just. The level of confidence and cool and collection, like I'm, I'm yeah. such a big fan of his because it's, um, he, he grew and people get locked into that narrative of whoever you are, early in your college football career where he's trying to do. A no, lot. he's the growth, the like his growth and and maturation is something that I talked about when he said he was coming back. I was like, I am all in. I was like, this dude yeah. is going to raise his stock as an NFL player. Because of this. And when you look at this game comparison, 479 yards to 511, uh, 192 rushing to 212. I mean, the the average per rush, 4.5, 5.6. Uh, I mean, the, the numbers were so, like, so close on both sides that it's clear that the turnovers, the two turnovers by Utah were the difference in the game where UCLA only had one well, Be, and because they were Tavion. four for four in the red zone. They were four. Yeah, you, have, you, you have Tavion Thomas on your team. It's not just the turnovers. It was the turnover on downs. You had Tavion Thomas on your team on a fourth and one, and you run a quarterback sneak with Cam Rising, and he doesn't get it. Yep. Are you so surprised that UCLA, after, like – after the way their season started, because they started slow against Bowling Green, they almost lost to South Alabama. Like that, this has turned into the knocking the doors off of Washington, which which I think that we've seen that Washington's defense is terrible. Uh, but 
knocking the doors off of them and then turning around and beating Utah, this is what people were expecting out of Chip Kelly. And, and if you notice, people are actually in the stands at the uh, Pac-12, I'm sorry, at um, at the Rose Bowl now. Yeah, I mean, it's hard to fill that thing, so it wasn't, you know, that deep in the deep in the first quarter, you still had one end zone that was completely empty, but it was... Well, that's been big because people were trying to get into the game because they because they forgot, dude. They, when forgot I went to the, the South time. Alabama, dude, when I went to South Alabama, from the time I parked to the time I walked in, I mean, granted, I parked extremely close. Like, I could have threw a rock and hit the stadium. But, but still, that would have normally been at least a 20-minute walk-in. It took yeah. me five minutes to w- go through the, the metal detector and w- get to the tunnel. Five minutes. And what with the amount of people there the um, for the Utah game, that was like a 45-minute or an hour. Yeah. Um, I, I, I'm hoping that people continue to come out and see a great product because, again, when you talk about the offensive line and, and DTR, that's you know there are so many uh, upperclassmen on this team that it's not it's not going to be that way in 2025. It's going to be um, not not necessarily a, a rebuild or a reload. We don't know what it's going to look like with Ethan Garbers or if they bring somebody else in. It's going to be interesting though. Right now they've they've matured uh, together and they understand this system and the way that Chip Kelly kind of game plans for each individual opponent you're not going to put as much energy into this out of conference stuff as you do the in conference stuff. So it, it's no surprise to me that they look better in conference than they did in some of those out of conference games. Um, they're good, man. They're, they're good. I underestimated them. I had to bump them in the power rankings pretty drastically. <laughs> in a row. And I will also say that like this, this offensive line to me is the key to, the conference if they yeah. stay if they stay healthy i think they have a legitimate shot to win it all to for sure playoff um will they win out i don't believe that that's a thing like I, until i see it that's not really a thing that happens here um however however i think this is something utah will learn from we have to understand utah is notoriously piss poor in socal notoriously piss poor in socal like the fact that they got the game against USC last year was the extreme outlier. Yes. So I think if you you put these teams uh, in a, on a neutral field or you put them in Salt Lake again, this well, is a game. Until well, you get USC minutes. in Salt Lake this week, buddy. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's gonna be we're tough. Gonna, we're gonna find out. And shout out to Clark Phillips for the stat pad pick six. Yeah, that was pretty fun. Um, uh, Washington Huskies thirty eight. Arizona State Sun Devils 45. When I was watching this game, I was like, wait, what? Excuse me? Excuse me? Like, I I knew that Washington's defense wasn't what we thought it was. But then also, that's super surprising considering what they did to Michigan State. But then you're like, holy, like, bro, Michigan State stinks right now. That, That is a terrible, terrible football team at this point in time. But you had Michael Penix Jr., who's lighting it up, 311 yards. He didn't throw it for a touchdown in this game, surprisingly. Um, one interception. And um, and Trenton Borgay, who has been much m- maligned, came in for Emory Jones, threw three touchdowns, 182 yards. I mean... Are you surprised at how this game went at the quarterback position? Yes and no. I mean, you talk about Trent Borgay being much. That's maligned. your guy. It is my guy, but we're like we're talking about much maligned, like by Herm Edwards, <laughs> like not not by anybody on the outside because nobody knows anything about him. Which is so was he a walk on? He was a walk on. Yeah, he is. So here's his whole backstory. We had him on for an hour last night on this ASU Twitter Spaces that I co-host last night to just talk about his backstory he is the seven on seven guy like that's who he is they started a seven on seven organization in tucson called tucson turf and him and his friends dominated every elite player in the country and now that organization is upwards of 250 kids across all age levels he and his father started it he played db 
and quarterback in seven on seven tournaments in like 10 different states across America over the course of his high school career. So not only was he in quick passing situations, and you know that seven on seven can be highly beneficial depending on the attitude you take toward it. Yes. Um, but the best, the best thing for any quarterback is to get reps. He has thousands more reps than any other quarterback because of the dedication to seven on seven in tight window spaces. He also played defensive back against some of the best quarterbacks in the country. Um, he took a, his initial team to like a, a, a championship game of the first tournament. And he had like a, like a fourth grader on the roster with him. He's, he he. So he's really well known in certain circles, but in the college football circles, because he didn't get those offers, even though he set five A passing records in the state of Arizona, um, he's five eleven, one sixty five, one seventy, and so he didn't he didn't he he chose to walk on at Arizona State. He's been in the running to be the number two quarterback, despite the fact that they have seven on scholarship for like the last three years. He probably could have gone into this season as a starter. He was endorsed by some of his teammates when um, Jalen Daniels left for LSU. However, um, Herm Edwards publicly said that the quarterback of the future might not be on the roster yet. And they went shopping for Emory Jones and they brought him in. Um, Trent was uh, Trenton was recovering from injury and and didn't have the best spring, but they, there wasn't really a separation between the two. So what Herm Edwards said was, we need a guy who can give us uh, results when everything breaks down. And for him, that was Emory Jones. And we've seen what Emory Jones brings to the table over, over his six games as a starter. Uh, Trent Borgay is somebody who knows the offense back and forth. He's a crazy football mind, whatever physical limitations you might think are there, he's going to get the ball where it needs to go. Yeah. So for him to come in, it, it wasn't nothing that happened was a surprise. That's who he is. I think it was a surprise to a lot of people that your backup could move the offense that efficiently after four straight years of like one read and run. Yeah. Guys. So uh, not a surprise at the same time, 35 offensive points in two and a half quarters when you struggled offensively that much was a surprise. It was as much of a surprise to see Jordan Clark get nine tackles and a pick six when he's kind of been injured and, and he's on the yep. smaller side. Um I don't think I'm not. I Washington's defense is obviously bad. I think it's a scheme issue, not a talent issue. And their offense is obviously good. They can't play in Tempe. It's been 21 years since they won down there. I still consider Washington to be the better team overall. I think in Seattle, I think it would go the other way. It's just going to be really interesting to see what ASU does from here because Emory Jones has a concussion. He's coming back from a concussion. They got a bye week and then yeah. they have Stanford. What would you do? You saw Trent play. You saw the way the, the offense moved. You've seen five weeks of Emory. I know what I would do, but I'm not objective. So I'm <laughs> here from an outside perspective. Oh, my God. It, it, it would depend on practice for me at that point. Like, I, I, I don't know if this was a large enough sample size to make a full switch. But you did only win one game with Emory Jones at quarterback. And this is one of those things. If you make that change – it's a it's a full it's a full change. Like like you can't be like oh I'm gonna play both. No, you have to make a full change if that's what you're gonna do. Full change. So you say dependent on practice. Well, so well, you, mm, no. So that you're not because what? How do you subscribe to the whole thing of like you don't lose your job to? And even though we have a million uh, examples of the, people the, losing their jobs to injury, that is a that is a lie, Craig. That is a lie. <laughs> Dude, yes, you can lose your job to to injury. Now, if I think it would have been easier on Arizona State if they had a game this weekend and Emory Jones couldn't play, and then Trenton got another start, I think that would make it easy. I just think it's going to be hard to make that switch off of, you know, three quarters of football. Yeah, um, and, that, and, the, and it makes you wonder because – if you leave it up to practice. Because it uh, wasn't like Emory was uh, bad. He was seven for nine before he went out. He, he was. He was. He was moving the ball. Um, yeah. Would the he, same thing have happened? I mean, it's. I think it was pretty night and day. Like, I think you watch the two quarterbacks, and you there are very obvious differences in the way the offense moved in the way that, you know, I, I think Emory doesn't like to turn the ball over like Jaden Daniels didn't like to turn the ball over. So there's a couple of times where Trent, like, gave Brian Thompson an opportunity to catch a, a deep ball even though there were two defenders in the area 
that's not a thing that I've typically seen from Emory. Yeah. I think it's an interesting situation because you have an interim coach and Emory Jones was Herm Edwards guy, but Herm Edwards is gone. It's like that line from uh, Hamilton. Well, it's like, hey, we signed a treaty, but it's like, oh, yeah, we signed a treaty with the king and his head's in a basket. You want to take yeah. him out and ask it? Like, if yep. he's offended that we broke the treaty, he's dead. So Herm Edwards is gone. Sean Aguano is trying to fight for this job. He's going to have to make a very tough decision, but this is what he signed up for. Yep. He wants the job. You have to make these tough choices. Hey, hey, if they if they go on to finish like five and seven, boy, oh, boy, I think that 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 – that this is Sean Sean Aguano's job if he can get to five wins. And again, I want to reiterate that I think it should be Sean Aguano's job in 2023. I don't think ASU should be making any decisions until they oh until they under, yeah their until, future yep. It, and I'm okay with having an interim. We we uh what Bud Sil Bud Selig was an interim commissioner for like six years before he was the actual commissioner like. I'm fine with having an interim for for 18 months if that's yeah, what but it that, takes to understand. That's tough for recruiting, though. That's tough for recruiting. In the portal era, they're already in hell. You talked about it. You 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 had a rant <laughs> on Matt Rule this week. You had a rant on Matt Rule this week where you brought up Arizona State's uh, roster issues. You know, it's gonna be it's gonna be tough for whoever comes in unless they are able to bring in 20 guys from the portal who are ready to play right away. That's true. Uh, next game up, Washington State 14, USC 30. Now, watching Washington State play is probably one of the more frustrating things that I can – like watching this game and watching Washington State, I was like, I'm so frustrated. So frustrated. Because now they ran the ball at 10 yards a carry with, with Jenkins. He only got 13 carries. Cam Ward, when he has to be on time, is good. When when it's like quick passing game, but when he has to stand back there, survey the landscape, he's just waiting on an opportunity to make a play. And like there were some people that were alluding to him and the NFL. I was like, nothing about Cam Ward is an NFL quarterback at this point in, at this point in time. Not that he can't be later, but at this point in time, he's not an NFL quarterback. And USC just held I, on. No, go I want to. Inter- I do want to interject with the way that your former uh, offensive coordinator used Justin Herbert to say, like, we sometimes we don't know because someone is being used in a way that's not oh conducive to their strengths, right? And you, but you would figure that a coach that has been with with Cam Ward at Incarnate Word and now at Washington State would understand how to use him. This game was infuriating though. Please continue. Yes. <laughs> you, you had Washington state miss opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And then on USC side, it was frustrating. If you're a USC fan, cause you're like, why can't we run away from them? And this is what I've been trying to tell people about USC is that they are not the seventh best team in the country. They have major flaws. They just haven't run into anybody who can expose the. Well, actually, they ran into Oregon State. Oregon State exposed it. Problem is, Oregon State literally has no quarterback right now. He threw four interceptions, four, and they lost, and they only scored 17 points. Think about that. Yeah. Four interceptions and you only score 17 points? That means that you can be put in a in an absolute headlock. And USC has played Rice, terrible. Stanford, terrible. Fresno State, bad this year. Oregon State, no quarterback. Arizona State, at they just ran out of talent. And, and Washington State just missed opportunity after opportunity after opportunity. And if you're a USC fan, you were billed on this. Uh, like, if you notice how they would come out, it was, our offense is going to be great. It's the Lincoln Riley. They're not scoring as many points as that. Like they are not, uh, at the point where people thought that they were going to be the number one offense in the Pac-12. Scoring offense, they are fifth in the Pac-12. They are averaging forty points a game, but it's number number one. Look who you've played, and also, like they're fifth in the Pac-12 in scoring. 
and they don't have the type of open field playmakers that they're going to need to make this system go. The thing I worry about with the Pac-12 is you wait. You, you said they don't have enough open. How how don't they have playmakers? They got Mario Williams, the uh, the uh, the uh, kid from Pitt. Some oh. people are some people are really fast possession receivers, or they're the guys that take it take things over the top. Not everybody is a guy that can get a screen and and make two or three people miss for those huge chunk plays of yardage after the catch. They got a bunch of guys that will bring the ball down if you get it in their vicinity, and they'll create space and get open. But I don't see USC getting a bunch of uh, uh, yards off of getting the ball to a playmaker at the line of scrimmage and letting them work. Uh, Arizona State was able to slow USC down for the most part by keeping everything in front of them. Oregon State was able to do it through the same, also having length in the defensive backfield. You know, USC is in a position where it's testing the outside to see, you know, are your defensive backs going to come up and make the tackle? And so far, the answer has been yes. So until they get until they get a couple of guys, and and I, I'm not saying that they're devoid of talent. The thing that scares me about USC is so many teams have let them got get away with not being fully meshed as a team yet that by the end of this season, if everybody is tapping into their talent and getting coached up, then in USC finds their footing, it could be bad for everybody else. So you miss the opportunity to beat them when they were actually vulnerable and Washington state missed a huge opportunity because one player on 15 touches had 184 yards, one player on your team and you weren't forcing the ball to him you weren't running the ball. You it, it, it reminds me. You ever have you ever been playing Uno, and you have a like draw four wild card in your hand, but you only got like four or five cards left, and you know that that you're gonna play that card and that's gonna turn the game around, and and the pile something gets put down on the pile and it's not a color that you have. You could play that wild draw four, or you could risk and draw out of the pile and see if like yeah you can keep keep that good card in your hand right. That's how I felt like running is working, but they were trying to see if they could get Cam Ward going. And he was getting sacked over and over and yep. pressured over and over. There is no reason why they couldn't have been running that uh, the the slow mesh or the draw or, or, or handing the ball off. There's no reason they couldn't have been doing that. And they just gave USC so many chances and killed their own drives. It was very frustrating to watch them on offense. It made me feel like they're fraudulent. Um, and that was the same thing that I came away with. That was the same thing that I came away with. Now, I put out a tweet after the games, well, dur- during the games this weekend. I said, Travis Dye, well, I said, Bucky Irving from Oregon, the running back, greater than Travis Die. Which you said on our show last week, too. Yeah, and people thought that, that and, and they're like, oh, you're a hating. No, and I said, there's, there's, no, there's no hate because Travis Dye is a good back. Like, there's no denying that. He also, while he was at Oregon, fumbled too much. And he, and like, he, he's not as elusive as people think he is. And, and he's broken some tackles at USC. Like, that's, that's what he does, but he's light in the ass. So, like, there are times where he gets tackled by, by people and he can't fight for those additional yards. And so that means that I think that Travis Dye is a really good back, but I think Bucky Irving is an NFL back. Yeah. I look at Travis Dye as like a third down guy in the NFL. If he gets his pass pro, right? Like that's. Yeah, but it's going to be hard for him to pass pro at that size in the NFL with them linebackers running downhill because they're going to be like, I'm not going around you. I'm gonna go straight over you. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I understand that he is a very good college football player. I've always enjoyed him. I fought with you on this show for years about him. He at one point he was carrying the ducks and and I get that he I get that he fumbles. I also think that like it's been so ingrained into football people that fumbling is like cheating on your spouse or something like that. <laughs> then it happens. It happens. Like, yeah, yeah, it, trying, sometimes yes. it's a ball security issue and sometimes it's the fact that like the your the way that people are like I look at the I'm out here in Charlotte and I watch the way the Carolina Panthers play and there's eight dudes on Christian McCaffrey every time he touches the ball because yeah. they all know the ball's coming his way. It would not be a I'm I'm amazed that he holds on to the ball. Like, um, but I I don't know. I think that they are getting the most out of Travis Dye right now. He's a rental for them at at USC. I understand your tweet and I understand that 
fans are going to feel that way anyway about the players that chose to stick around. But, yeah. but, but based upon my, my history and what you know about me and Travis die, do you think that that's hate or do you think that's what I objectively think? I think that you have been, I, here's what I'll say. I do think that you've been hating on USC all year and I'm fine with it. That's, <laughs> they're gone anyway. It doesn't matter to me. However, however, you have had legit criticisms of Travis Dye for years, so it's not like you changed at all. And when he was doing well, you were like, oh, he's improved. Oh, I appreciate him. Especially when it was like 60% of the yards were going through Travis Dye. Yes. CJ, they couldn't get C.J. Verdell going. You're like, oh, if I have to like this guy, I'm going to like this guy. But you've never been a Travis Dye guy through and through, and so there's nothing about it where I'm like, oh, you're just being a USC hater or saying don't let the door hit you on the way out. You wouldn't have mind him sticking around, but I don't think Oregon's missed a beat. And I, I don't no. think you're wrong about that part. Yeah, in, in I think particular. Oregon's running back room is better this year than it's been since, shit, since like Kenyon Barner and LaMichael Le- Le- James were there. Which makes it mutually beneficial because I don't know if yeah, Travis correct. Dye is getting 20. I don't know if he's getting 20 touches in Eugene this year. Correct. And people are like, well, look look at the stats. He's got he's higher than him on rushing. He's got 570 71 yards compared to Bucky Irving, who has 429. Yeah, but Bucky Irving also literally has exactly 30, 30 less carries. <laughs> so you you give a dude who's averaging over seven yards a carry an additional 30 carries. Yeah, yeah, I'm gonna take my. But um, and at the same time, it would have been fun to see Travis Dye and Kenny Dillingham's offense because yep. they seem to get a lot of players in space, and that's where he was at his best. Correct. Now, what did you think about Caleb Williams? Because this dude is a magician. This dude is a magician, a- and the thing I love about him as a player, it's not that he always makes these heroic big plays and all of this stuff. No, he just manages the game really well. Like, he's yeah. clearly got elite talent, but the thing is, he doesn't throw the ball away to to the other team. He no. doesn't at all. He So, he protects the football. He gives you a chance to win, and that's the he most important. Throw, and he will throw to you in one-on-one coverage, yep. which that's not an Emory thing. That's not a Jaden Daniels thing. Like, that, you have to give your receivers a chance to make a play, and he'll do that. Has he been perfect? Is his completion percentage all that great? No, I think completion percentage, as long as you're getting chunk plays, can kind of be uh, overrated. Yeah, I don't, ha- I don't have a lot of patience for people right now who are trying to poke holes in his game. Oh yeah, I don't know there- what it is, but I just don't. There, it seems like there's so many people trying to say that he's not. Like I brought up how Dorian Thompson Robinson's confidence level is off the charts, and then a bunch of people were like, wanted to get into a discussion about how he's better than Caleb Williams. They're two very different football players. I'd be happy to have either one quarterback in my team, but it's not, it's just not the same. Yep. It's not the same. Dorian Thompson Robinson's like that learning curve of all of those mistakes that he made, that doesn't exist in Caleb Williams' history. Yep. He's either exactly. trying, he's either trying to figure it out or he's making it for plays. He's not costing the team. USC is it, they haven't left a bunch of stuff on the table because of bad decision making on his part. And I think he's just his level of preparedness and how he doesn't get shook and his ability to make some plays that I don't think anybody else in the country can make. I don't think it's a conversation about about who is better. I think they both work for what uh, Correct. what what is going on right now. I just I the Caleb Williams stuff, I I've, I've seen enough. He is very very special correct I, and i don't see him having like a big drop off or making a bunch of mistake have we seen them when they're down we've seen them in close games yeah and he wasn't like he wasn't perfect but that you know i think I that know. we will find out more information about him this weekend versus utah <laughs> and yes. the, and this team all right uh oregon 49 arizona 22 um oregon One opportunity for arizona huge blown opportunity because they didn't need to get blown out in this game. Correct. Correct. It started with that fumble in the, in the, when, when they had the ball in the red zone, I think it was still zero, zero. Like at the, at the seven yard line with 11 minutes left in the first. Yep. And they fumbled, fumbled the ball and the rest was history, buddy. <laughs> like, like that was the, the ball on a wide receiver end around 
from the inside exchange that was so unnecessary and would have gotten blown up. Yes. Oh, yeah. I don't know if that's why the exchange went wrong. I think it was just, I think it was just trying to get way too cute, but like that was unnecessary. And you might look and see like, oh, and then it was 21 3, but that's not even the story. It was 7 3 at the end of the first quarter. Yep. And Arizona had the ball in Oregon territory. Yep. They did not need to get blown out, but they spent the whole first half playing like they were down 28 trying to get back in the game. Well, and see, but that's the that's the thing that happens when teams play good teams. They they feel like that they need to press a little bit. And then when Oregon started scoring, when it was like 14-3, you're like, whoa, whoa. <laughs> then it's 21-3. And, and that's where you do not want Jaden Delora in that situation. Because no. – because when because he's a guy who's going to, and I mean this in a good way, he's going to try to will his team back. With and when his he arm. yeah, and when Not he gets legs correct, and when when he gets into that mode, it changes. You know, he gets a little more risky, a little more inaccurate. Balls get in trouble. You incomplete passes, and then you don't end up. You know, being able to to get yards and Oregon has done a fantastic job against the uh, run. So they're averaging giving up, I think 98 yards a game, which is the best in the conference. And when, when they make a team one dimensional, that's when they've got you. If they, if you are yeah. forced to, if you cannot run the football, then, then that creates a significant problem. Or like, what if you make yourself one dimensional for no reason? And give, well, I Oregon would have won this game. They probably would have won it by two touchdowns because I think four quarters tells the truth. But Jesus, dude! But like, didn't I tell you though? Didn't didn't I tell you that that what was the line in this game? Thirteen. I think so. Yeah. I was like, bet the <laughs> bet the bet the college fund on that one, buddy. That, that this was such a layup. Such and a layup. We talked about like Kenny Dillingham was back in Arizona. He he left Offer and a few kids in the state of Arizona. He went out to games. You knew he was going to want to beat that ass because no matter what, Arizona is – no matter if he's going to be in the running for the Arizona State job or not, he was juiced to be in his hometown. Yep. He was like Paul Pierce playing against the Clippers or Lakers. Like he was home and he wanted to show out, and you knew Oregon was going to put points on the board. But the biggest difference in this game to me was – if Bo Nix looks down the field and he sees that he might have somebody 50 yards down the field, but it's second and four and there's a six yard window of open space for him to move the sticks, he's going to move the sticks. I love that. I love that, dude. It's helpful. Yes. Because if, if Jaden Delora is in that same situation, he's going to not throw it to the guy that's 50 yards down the field not take the run, he's going to throw it to the guy that's 70 yards down the field yeah. for no reason. <laughs> like, no, no, just yeah. get the first down yeah. and, and live to fight another play. And he reminds me of, like, he reminds me of the type of person that, like, they, they can't, like, like, if I came to you and I was like, George, I got inside information, Wyoming minus three this weekend, drop a bag on it and you're going to be good. And then I call you after Wyoming wins by two touchdowns. And I'm like, did you take my advice? And you're like, yeah, but it wasn't enough action for me. So I parlayed it into an eight leg and I lost $10,000. <laughs> like, that's what he reminds me of. He's like, just, I need, I need to throw the ball all the way down the field just to feel something. <laughs> <laughs> and, and that's, that's cool the... when it works, but man, it was yep. just so unnecessary against Oregon. Yeah, and Oregon got uh, a player thrown thrown out for targeting, and I and I can't tell you how much I hate these targeting penalties in in college football. Washington State got the, a tackle kicked out against USC. He didn't even hit him in the in in the head. Yes, it was a blindside block, but it, it's but it feels like the conference who's initiating a lot of these re re reviews is just actively. Like that when when it's called on the field, it has a legitimate shot of being adjudicated correctly. But if San Francisco calls it in and stops the game, they're not overturning it under no circumstances. And you're sitting there as a fan, like, bro, like, can we like I understand that 
that it's tough when people get get hit some sometimes. But you have to understand the nuance in targeting. Like that there needs to be a targeting one and a targeting two. Like targeting two, you get kicked out of the game. Targeting one is just a 15-yard penalty. Because there are inc- there's incidental contact because people are moving so fast, and right. and, 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 and in USC it, you had you a dude get kicked work, out. You could also have it work like the NBA, where if you get two of them, even if they're both incidental, you yeah. got to sit the rest of the game. Correct. Yeah, and and then when 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 you have like six three guy on five eight guy, bro, it's tough. <laughs> that happened in the ASU game. BJ yep. Green. BJ Green is shorter and he had his head down. He shouldn't don't have your head down. I'm going to throw that out there. Just don't. But he had his head down and he got uh, um, Michael Penix got hit from the other side. Yes. Which pushed him into BJ Green, who had his head down and BJ Green got disqualified for targeting. And then Penix and Penix ended up getting the wind knocked out of him. And it was kind of, it was a it was a rough play. But it was one of those things where it was like, was this targeting or an accident? Because yes. It to me like. Like BJ Green wouldn't have hit him if he didn't get hit from the other side. So correct. I don't know. I'm I'm with you. It there there needs to be more nuance, but you put more decision making with nuance in the hands of Pac-12 officials. And is that a good idea? No, the answer is no. <laughs> All right. Um, I want to give some some Bo Nix love though. A man that I have slandered for years. For years. For years. Our, if you go back to our first episode, it's very possible it includes Bo Nix slander. Oh, yeah. Yeah, because that was when Oregon was going down to go play Auburn. He was terrible in the game except for the last drive. Terrible. And granted, it was his first start, but still. <laughs> and I've never thought that Bo Nix was I, – like, I've thought that he had good moments at Auburn. But I never in my life thought that he would be playing the way he's playing football right now. So it's amazing a dude with a competent offense and competent coaching playmakers around him where he's not being asked to, to do everything. Then it's amazing how good that he's been. Yeah. I mean, and, I and, and, and it helps when you rush for 306 yards as a, as a team. Very helpful. And, it, and the, he doesn't take a lot of negative plays. Um, the H word, Please let's leave. Like I, I think. Shh, shh, let's, shh, shh, shh. Yeah. No. Nope. Let's leave. Let's leave that out of it. Um. However, uh, I was listening to, and there are so many Pac-12 podcasts now, and so it, you know, I, my entire week is spent listening to people. That it seems like the whole Pac-12 football podcast landscape is just a collection of everybody who hates pronouncing names correctly. Um, <laughs> pre- present company included. Uh, who? But, who me? Yeah. <laughs> Pronounce this word. S H O U G H. S H S H O U. Shug. Yep, there we go. See? Uh shout out to Tyler Shug. Um, but so I don't even remember what I was talking about anymore because I wanted to get that shot in. Oh, so I was listening to <laughs> the, the the John and John podcast, Wilner and Canzano, and they they brought up that they don't think that the selection committee would give Oregon a shot at twelve and one. And I can't like that. I can't. I can't imagine a scenario where they wouldn't, especially with the way that they have won after that game. Yeah, and but at the same time, like what, nobody pays it when it, by the time it gets to be your first game in the season. Plus, you factor in what everybody else in college. I cannot imagine a scenario in which a twelve and one Oregon. First of all, Oregon's not going twelve and one again. This is the Pac twelve. Nobody goes undefeated, right? So, but if Oregon goes twelve and one, they're not going to be fifth in the country. Not with Utah, UCLA, USC being ranked, Washington State being respected. And you would have had to beat every single one of them, probably. Yes. Yeah, and so I uh, like that one. That one surprised me because it was like, well, USC has a chance, UCLA has a chance, and at the time they'd said Utah, but I, but they'd said, you know, I don't see the, I, they think that the blowout to Georgia would preclude them from being selected if they're twelve and one. There's no situation on earth where a twelve and one Power Five team 
is not included because the landscape of college football is there's not going to be a ton of one loss teams anyway, Correct. especially one that won 12 in a row with four victories over ranked teams in the process. It just doesn't happen. Yep. You are right about that. Um, now the last game on the slate was Oregon state Stanford. Oh, yo, can, can we please stop pretending about Oregon state? Cause, cause Stanford is awful. Stanford is awful. And Oregon State almost lost this football game. They literally had to win it at the end of the game. And if and I tweeted, I said, if Stanford had fans, they would blow up Twitter for, for how they lost. I mean, they would, any major fan base would have been trending number one after the way that they lost on that, on that long pass at the end of the game. Yeah. Uh, what do you want to talk about with this game? Because I had, there's so much so much that confused me on both sides i left angry at both teams okay why um, oh, oh okay well, why did you leave angry at stanford well stanford it was primarily the fourth quarter so and and they gave up 18 points in the fourth quarter yeah and and the defensive effort up to that point there were two very long drives by oregon state that were very impressive Yep. That took up a bunch of yardage, a bunch of time, and they looked very Oregon State. Like, masterful play calling by uh, um, Jonathan Smith and, and, and uh, what's his OC's name? Uh, Harson? Not Harson. Yeah. Harson. No. Oh, Harson. dude, no. Har- Harson's down at, at... Ryan Lindgren? Ryan yes. Lindgren. Yeah. Different I-N last name, uh, or E-N. But, uh, so, they, they had two drives where they really looked like themselves. They never looked rattled. They never looked shook. There was one throw by Ben Goldbranson that went to Silas Bolden in the back corner of the end zone that was like the dimiest of dimes, right? So yeah. Oregon, Oregon State was doing its thing with its limitations, and they were just kind of the little engine that could. They kept at it. Stanford's defense had played with so much energy and so much swag for three quarters, and then they legitimately just went soft. And I don't know what to blame that on. And – and then, still, there was no excuse for losing this game. They had the ball with less than a minute 30 left. Did they bring in Ari Patu because of his mo- – did they take Tanner McKee out? Am I imagining uh, this? Did no. Did they bring in Ari no, Patu no, no, and they, then run a slow no, no, uh, no, no, mesh no. play where Ari Patu kept the ball and got tackled for a loss on third and, like, one? No, 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 no. Did they, uh, Ari Pat, Patu, he didn't come in the game. It was the, it was the Daniels kid. Um, okay. Yeah. Well, what what in the hell was that? Well, uh, he's there. He's there. Uh, Jack Coletto. He's the guy that they put in for go like north and south. Yep. The, go this north and w- south. That cost you the game. Oregon State tried as hard as they could in that fourth quarter to make oh. as many bad decisions as possible to allow Stanford to win, and it didn't matter. They went for two for no reason, and yep. they didn't use Jack Coletto. They went for two for no reason again. Or I guess for a reason because of the last one, but they didn't use Jack Coletto. And then George, on their third touchdown of the quarter, they took a knee, which was the dumbest thing I have Bro. ever seen. Because what if Stanford got in field goal range? If Tanner McKee completes that pass instead of throwing an interception, they're one ten yard play away from having an attempt to beat you instead of to tie. Yep. Why did they take a knee? Like Oregon State was just – it was like Oregon State had money on Stanford, and Stanford wouldn't stop them because they had money on Oregon State. Yep. (laughs) (laughs) Bro, I – okay, so I think we need to give some credit to Go Go Branson. He came in and he played well. Like, he was 20 for 28. He didn't turn the ball over. Uh, Three for three on that last drive. Yeah, so that that matters, right? Mm -hmm. Um. And that takes a long time to get to the receiver, though. Yeah, it does. Football takes a long time to get there. <laughs> that, that thing was a moon ball, and is especially that last touch, touchdown to a Harrison. I mean, oh, yes, God. on that last touchdown, interfere. Yes, interfere. What is the? Why not? Push yeah, it's it's only fifteen Him. yards. What's that uh, video? Twist his dick. Like do whatever. <laughs> Anything do- that you need to do. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, it, it was it was bad, dude. Like this was a bad, bad situation. I mean, this 
I, I, I think that this was the loss that kind of signals the end for David Shaw. Because, well, I actually, actually, maybe the beginning of the end or kind of the ending of the end because it, after they lose to Notre Dame this, this weekend, I don't know how, I, I, and I like David Shaw. And I might, I like David Shaw. I think he's good for the Pac-12. I think he's good for Stanford. Absent significant changes, like bringing in an offense, like forcing him to change his offensive and defensive situ- situation at coordinators and coaches and all of that. Absent that, I don't know how you keep him. But I don't know who you get to replace him. Well, then that's that also becomes the interesting thing because you know what I would absolutely do? What? If I was the... Uh, top name out there I would absolutely go for the Stanford job job above all else because any other job is going to pay me half Mm. and I don't and they're going to guarantee my contract so I don't have to turn anything around the incentive to make Stanford good based on their budget right now is abs it, it doesn't exist because you have to figure they they've let it be known that their budget is a minimum for the staff as a whole is a minimum of 13 million a year. We're talking SEC money yeah. that is going to their to their coaching staff. Give me that job and give me the patience that you showed David Shaw and let me walk out of there 40 million dollars richer. Yeah. 20 million because I paid uh NorCal rent. But like, <laughs> no, that's a that is a good point. Um yeah, that it's just tough. All right. Now, on to this weekend. We have some games. We have Cal versus Colorado. Cal must, it must win. For for Cal. It's a must win for Cal. Yes. <laughs> yeah. Uh this game is on the Pac-12 network with BJ Long and Max Brown. What is the line on this game? I want you to guess and then I will give you the do you think it's three touchdowns? Uh, no, I say it's 17. You are correct, but not correct enough. It's only 15, believe it or not. I can believe that. With an over-under of 48, which is might be the lowest in the conference this year. Jeez Louise. Yeah, that's a lot. Oh, my gosh. That means that. That means that they're expecting Colorado not even to score like under they're expecting him to score under 20 points. Yeah. Yep. And all right, so who do you have in the game? California. I have Cal too. Colorado's 0 and 5 against the spread. This is probably their tightest spread uh since maybe the opening week. Um Air, I think no, Air Force was 17. Air yep. Force was favored by more. Yeah. I think Cal's got to go in there, feed Jade not, and just get off the field. Go in there, make sure this game is over by 430. And because you you got the rest of your season to worry about, and moving into the rest of your season four and two would be huge. Colorado might have some be energized coming off the, the bye with the coaching change, but it shouldn't matter if it's just fundamental stuff. Like you are better than them on the O line, and you're running the ball with a running back that they can't, they can't get down. I think yep. they have to be no nonsense about it, but I, I think they have to take it very seriously. It's weird to say that it's a must win, but it's Cal. Cal is the back half of their schedule. They're gonna have to fight to get two or three wins, so they need yeah. to go in at four and two. Yes. Yeah. 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 Th- this is the difference in being bowl eligible, or the possibility of being bowl eligible and not. All right, um, I got Cal as well. All right, Arizona at Washington. What is the line on this game? It's in Seattle, and Washington is favored by two touchdowns. Conversely, this over-under is the highest this week at 73. Yeah, there are going to be a lot of points scored in this game. And what did what'd you say the line was? Washington minus 14. I'm going to take the Huskies, bro. Really? Okay. I think they're going to score and score and score and score. Wait. Oh. Nope. Nope. I'm taking Arizona. I think it's going to be a 10-point victory for, for, for Washington. I'm taking Arizona. 
Okay, I think Arizona's putting points on the board for sure. But if they bring that same game plan to uh, to Seattle that they tried to use in Tucson last week, <laughs> then the game could get away from them. Yeah, that's um, a fact, Jack. There, it, I there's some DBs in this game. I hope you're wearing a Fitbit. I bet you're going to run like four miles. <laughs> <laughs> and that game's on Pac-12 Network with Ted Robinson and Yogi Roth. Yeah. He said, I'll put take, on a Fitbit. Cause he... I'll take I'll take Arizona. I do think Washington's going to win this game, but I think it'll be like eight to ten points. Yeah. I would love for it to be like a, a 55-45 final score. That'd be fun. Yep. All right. Uh, Stanford Cardinal in South Bend against Notre Dame on NBC. This game has lost a lot of its luster because neither team is ranked. Um, Yeah. Th- this, this is honestly a sad state of affairs, <laughs> a sad state of affairs. But I hope that it's, I, I just at least hope that it's a good game. You got all those future lawyers on the field on both sides. Put up a fight. Yeah. Pretend it's a courtroom. Okay. I, in this game, I want Notre Dame to win mm-hmm. because I want uh, their 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 new head coach to do well, and I think that that it's already too late for David Shaw. Right. Uh, I I just want it to be close. That's all I care about. Seventeen points is a massive spread. It's a yeah. massive spread, especially Ooh, for my team God. offense. Notre Dame's offense has not really done anything to inspire the type of confidence that even if Stanford didn't score, that it would be 17, nothing. Oh my God, bro. Oh, um, Marcus Freeman team. Okay. Let's, let's see what they've done. So they beat BYU 28 to 20. They beat North Carolina 45 to 32 and North Carolina's defense is awful. They beat Cal 24, 17. All right, I don't see this as a 17-point win. Nope, nope, nope. I th- I'm taking Stanford, but Notre Dame gets the win. I am with you. I will I will follow your lead on this one. Yeah, yeah, I, I just don't. Uh, yeah, the way Notre Dame has played, they've gotten some points put up on them. The, Notre Dame hasn't beaten anybody by 17 points. So... So why am I to believe that this is going to be the start of that? <laughs> um, they lost to Marshall. All right, USC at Utah. The game of the week. The game of the week. What is the line in this game? This is, I believe, USC is favored. And they are no, 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 no. Utah minus three and a half. I was wrong. That is fascinating. This feels like one of those uh, lines where they're baiting USC fans. Oh, to 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 take the line. Yeah, plus three and a half. Oh God, dude, give me Utah or give me death in this game. Well, actually, no. Don't give don't give me death, but give me <laughs> give me Utah. So this game, I, it's weird to say this in week seven um, or game seven, but I think we're actually going to find out which, if it's Thule Tupelotu or Clark Phillips is the Pac-12 Defensive Player of the Year. Because right now those two are absolutely running away with it. There's yeah. other people who, who are making an argument to like, who's going to win the bronze? But right now it's down to two players and they're going to be on the field at the exact same time. I think that as long as Cam Rising limits any negative plays, if th- this is a real turnover battle game because y- y- USC doesn't give the ball away. So if Utah matches that energy and they don't give the ball away, I do think that they're one touchdown better. Yep. So give me give me Utah. Um, I don't feel great about it because one of these teams turns the ball over and the other one doesn't. Yep. Uh, but I, it's all comes down to Utah taking care of the football. If they take care of the football, they will win this game. Bingo, buddy. Bingo, bingo, bingo. Give me Utah. That you, you couldn't have been more spot on there. Last game of the weekend, Washington State at Oregon State. What is this? And this game is on Pac-12 Network. Oh, my God. We, we don't even have an ESPN game this weekend. <laughs> Three Pac-12 Network games and then a Fox game. So e, e, ESPN was like, we only won one of them games. We do have a game on Peacock. Thank you, Notre Dame. Um, 
We so Oregon State will not. I believe Chance Nolan is probably done for a while, right? Like, yes. Are you hearing the same thing? Yes. Yeah. So it's Ben Goldbranson again. This is in Corvallis. Yep. So uh, Oregon State is favored by three and a half. The over under is fifty two and a half. I would hammer that under. Which means if you followed my picks this year. I was about to say, I would not have a hammer the under. I would actually take the over in that game. All right. um, I got to take Washington State. Maybe I believe in them too much. I do believe Oregon State can win this football game. But Washington State is slippery, dude. They are slippery. Like, that. that's the best way I can explain how Cam Ward plays. He's slippery. But but if you can get a hold of him though, oh you can choke him out. <laughs> but but if you but if he just is slipping out of your fingertips all the time, you're gonna be in for a miserable day. So Oregon State either wins this game on like the last play again, or they lose by like ten points. Yeah, and what's nice is Vegas has given you three, given three and a half to the home team, so you could take Washington State and they, you know, and all they'd have to do is is eke it out. I think I think it's super favorable to jump on the Cougars here at plus three and a half. Yeah, totally agree. Um, but before we get out of here, do you have anything else on the weekend? Because there are a lot of college football games this weekend that I'm super excited about. I'm excited about Alabama, tennis, Tennessee. Who do you think wins that game? Uh, it, if, if, if the rumors are true and Bryce Young was being saved for this game instead of putting him in last week, I do like him a little bit more than Hendon Hooker. Um, but Tennessee's so good. Um, I I think either way, I think it's going to be a barn burner. But I give me Alabama. Yeah, totally agree. Um, but but ten- Tennessee's tough, boy. Tennessee is tough, tough, tough. Um, now I'm rooting. I am rooting for Oklahoma State to beat TCU in uh, in Fort Worth this weekend, though. That's a that that's one that I actually do have a rooting interest because. If you look at Arizona State's schedule thus far, it's already absurd. But, you know, to have two multiple top 10 teams in there, then the two and four doesn't look as exactly as crazy. So I'm, I'm rooting for Mike Gundy to be a man and be, <laughs> be a be a man and be 40. Yeah, that that's going to be a good game, too. Um, this is a, and then there's another ranked game that is surprising that both of these teams are ranked, right? And it is Syracuse playing against NC State because there was a lot of people that were writing off Dino Babers as an early wonder, but now he's gotten his quarterback situation fixed better. And and this is going to be a big game because in the ACC standings, I mean, Syracuse is still undefeated. And when they get a chance to play at, at home in the JM, in, in what used to be the Carrier Dome, now the JMA Wireless Dome, then it is like they are a much tougher team in that in that situation. And then in the ACC, they are on the same side as Clemson, NC State, Wake Forest. Like all the good teams are on one side of the ACC. Yeah. Um yeah, so it'll be very, very interesting to see how that shakes out. Well, the Syracuse thing is funny because it's like it'd be like you're watching your grandma hit five three pointers in a row. It's like, oh my God, she's really getting this thing going, but it's very unlikely. Like it's possible Syracuse finishes five and seven. And they're five and oh right now. They have yep. to be like super steadfast in everything they do because they follow up NC State, who is for real. Uh, they haven't always put it together, but they are for real with number four Clemson at Clemson. I think I'm going to yep. go to that game. Then they got to play Notre Dame. Then they're at Pitt. Then they have Florida State. Then they have ranked Wake Forest and oh, State at Boston oh, College. God, God, <laughs> well, they need they need to be five and zero. Oh. They like they I I would be proud of them for being bowl eligible at the end of this run. But I do root for Tony White. He's their defensive coordinator. He used to be Arizona State's defensive coordinator. And I think he bounced when, uh, well, we won't get into why he bounced, but he, uh, he is out there at Syracuse and I'm rooting for them to continue to have success. All right. Uh, Penn state, Michigan, Michigan's favored by seven points in that game. 
Uh, Penn State is the most frustrating team in college football for me because normally when you have like four straight years of top ten recruiting classes, it matters. Um, yep. And and it did. It doesn't matter if they had four straight years of the number one recruiting class. Penn State just wants to make everything a close game, no matter who they play. Uh, do, I don't have any faith in Penn State at this at this me point. Either. I like James Franklin. Uh, and and it's funny because you like I don't have any it, and the guy on the other side is Jim Harbaugh, <laughs> so but uh, yeah I'm I'm on Michigan here. Yep, I totally agree. Um, you guys, I'm George Reister. He's Ralph Amson, and this is the Pac-12 Apostles. <laughs>